Um, the technical panels have presentations. The, we in the policy world, we're a little looser. Um, <laughs> so we're going we're to speak without slides. Uh, but hopefully as entertaining and as informative as the, all the previous panels, including the, uh, the, the, the last one, which I took a lot of notes on. It will take me several days to decipher um, what I learned f from that. So the title of our, our panel is Enabling Economic Growth and Innovation in a 5G World. What does empirical data and literature tell us? Well, there is very little empirical data and literature on 5G, um, not surprisingly. But nonetheless, we have assembled a pretty remarkable group here, as, as you'll see in a moment, uh, to talk about what we can learn from uh, previous experience, how we can extrapolate that, and what that might inform us from both an investment and a policy standpoint, uh, reflecting on some of what we heard. So let me first quickly introduce my uh, panelists. I'll just give you uh, highlights from their bios. Uh, because they all have long and, and uh, in impressive bios. But let me give you the, the quick on them. And then uh, we're each going to, each of them is going to sort of give an opening comment. And uh, then we'll come back and have some questions. And of course, we'll leave plenty of time for questions from you. So uh, starting to my left and moving down, uh, Tim Brennan, Professor Brennan, is a professor of public policy and economics at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, and a senior fellow with the Resources for the Future. Uh, before uh, joining UMBC in 1990, he was an economist with the Antitrust Division in the U.S. Department of Justice and taught in the Telecommunication Policy Program at George Washington University. He also served uh, in the late 90s as a senior economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors and 2003 to 2005, staff consultant to the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Now that's, you know, so, so now I have the other panelists. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and yet, they're all pretty uh, impressive in their own right. Uh, Next to Tim is uh, Jonathan Spalter, who's the chairman of Mobile Future. Uh, and if you don't know Mobile Future, it's an association working to support an environment which encourages investment and innovation in the dynamic wireless sector. Uh, prior to that, we'll skip several uh, of, of Jonathan's uh, credentials, but uh, during the Clinton administration, he was associate director at the U.S. Information Agency, served in the White House as director of public affairs for the National Security Council and chief international affairs spokesperson and speechwriter for Vice President Gore. Um, I'm, I'm glad I'm the moderator and not trying to, uh, to, to, to compete with this. Um, next to Jonathan is uh, Depayan Ghosh, who is technology policy advisor at the White House now. Uh, during his time there, he's worked on a range of technology policy issues, including consumer privacy, which is his area of expertise in particular, internet policy, broadband access, spectrum policy, and educational innovation. Uh, he also, uh, concurrent with that, he is a, a research fellow at my former institution, University of California, Berkeley School of Information, where he's doing postdoc work on cybersecurity and consumer privacy issues. And last but by no means least, Anna Maria Kovacs, who is a visiting senior policy scholar at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Uh, her expertise is in industry analysis, and her area of focus is on interplay between public policy and investment. Uh, she's followed the communications industry for over 30 years, either as a financial analyst or as a consultant. Uh, so that's the, that's the horsepower we bring you at the end of the afternoon. Um, so I'm just going to let everybody sort of give the, uh, an opening comment here, and then we'll have some questions, and I'm going to ask uh, Tim to go first. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank Larry and, uh, and John Mayo and Georgetown for having me here. Um, I probably should say part of the reason I'm here, I, I think they got a three-year-old bio from someplace. Um, I was the chief economist at the FCC in 2014. Oh, I couldn't find that. It, I, what, I, that's what I, th I thought. Yeah. Well, anyhow, uh, the, re the reason I mention that basically is I've, I've, I've decided to start issuing what I'm calling the reverse disclaimer, which is that anything that the FCC says doesn't necessarily represent the views of Tim Brennan or anyone <laughs> on, his, on, his, uh, on, on, on his staff, is, if I had one. Um, okay, uh, and also I just want to make an observation on the title quick was for people who are from the engineering side of things, both the economic side of things, you might think the phrase empirical data was somehow redundant but there are people actually in economics who use the phrase simulated data for, for doing things. I've never have quite figured out what that was all about. Um, I, I want to give 10 comments after an overarching observation. The overarching observation that economists in any event like this is to sort of keep an ear out for like, what's the market failure here? I mean, why are, why are we worried about this? And the, the main one that I've heard today I can imagine others, and some of them may come up in what I'll be talking about, is um, 
is, is that there's a huge transaction cost in reallocating spectrum from, from low value to now high value uses. Uh, how one gets around that isn't very easily, you know, check the incentive auctions, you know, hassles to try to, to understand why that is so difficult. But that sort of strikes me as a main one. Surely there's not a failure of imagination and innovative activity and that kind of thing. And that gets to um, uh, the first sort of the overarching, uh, first of the specific observations, which is just, to, just a reminder that the optimal level of innovation isn't infinite. Um, you know, there's a real opportunity cost of things, and you know, there's a sense in a lot of things like this as well. We always need more innovation, always need more innovation. And you know, and well, maybe you don't. I mean, it, you know, that there's an opportunity cost of those funds, either private or public, and there's even an opportunity cost of the spectrum. Although maybe our various processes don't reflect that accurately. Um, a second one, which will probably be viewed as quite heretical here, is, is the U.S. versus them aspect in some of this. There's been a little light today, which is good, although it was a little heavier in some of the things I read. Um, uh, before he became a, a notorious newspaper columnist, Paul Krugman was a major international trade person, and many years ago he contributed to a symposium the American Economic Association had on teaching international trade, and the one thing he said was, if we could teach students to wince whenever they heard the term competitiveness, we would have accomplished something. Uh, you know, that, that, you know, countries, it's not clear they compete. You know, there's a principle of comparative advantage out there. I was listening to some of the things today, and I'm thinking, well, gee, if, you know, if, if, um, if included in the billions of dollars that Seoul is probably wasting on the Olympics, they want to they want to uh, provide some free innovation that the U.S. can use for 5G services. Well, maybe we should just let them do it rather than try to keep up with them. Um, so that's something is just to keep in mind on that is to just be careful about these kind of, you know, um, us versus them sort of things. Um, uh, next is, is something that actually has come up in some of the talk discussions or comments is being clear on the technology, you know, in terms of, you know, that, that it's often hard to grasp for non-technologists, obviously, you know, Larry and others have made that comment, I'm, that's certainly true for me, but it's important because you're trying to justify innovation, support policy change, and so on, you're eventually going to have to sell this to somebody if you're trying to get some, something um, from some DC office out of this. Um, and there is something to, to keep in mind, at least from my FCC experience, is that um, there are engineers at the FCC, There's a chief, there are chief technologists at the FCC, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're getting all sides on engineering questions at the FCC. I mean, when I was at the FCC, the chief technologist there, and he said this in public, believes that essentially the last mile of a wireline system is a non-congestible water pipe, you know, where you know, innovation doesn't make a lot of sense and you don't have to worry about congestion or anything. Um, and I thought, you know, is, I mean, if the chief technologist had come from Comcast, for example, maybe you would have gotten a quite different view of things. Um, on the consumer side, one of the things I'm sort of wondering about here, I came in and I've heard some things about this, but I'm still not sure, is, is what's the killer app, a phrase I understand um, Larry has actually contributed to this discussion. Um, uh, among the, and it, a lot of this has raised questions about the sort of the, the, the Internet of Things, and I guess a question I just sort of wonder is this technical one, which is I understand everything, wanting to connect everything to something, but why does everything have to be connected to everything? <laughs> I mean, no, as a federal, federal employee, when the hacking of the federal employee database, you know, was revealed, the first question that crossed my mind was who had the stupid idea to connect this to the Internet? What was the point of that? And I sort of wonder about how many other things are like that, and is there some way to kind of, do we really want to have it, everything connected to everything else? I mean, there's a real security cost with that. Um, uh, I was thinking about it in terms of people were talking about the cars, and I thought, well, you know, what's the, you know, what's the disadvantage of detaching cars from the internet? Well, police can't monitor traffic, you know. What's the advantage of detaching? Well, police can't monitor traffic. You know, if you're at the, if you're at the Cato Institute, you got one view of this, and if you're at the, you know, at the, you know, Institute for Insurance Safety or something, you may have a different view of it. So, um, so I just sort of, I just kind of wonder about that. Something else is about on the spectrum demand, and this will have to do with a, with a couple other things about related to some sense to the killer app question. Is um, you know, is is the gigabit, you know, number. Um, and I think well, you know, we want to have gigabit service. We want to have all the spectrum do gigabit service. And I'm thinking. 
Well, suppose you just wanted to offer a 100 megabit service. That's not so bad. And I know it's not linear, but suppose it only took a tenth of the spectrum to do it. Might that be sort of like an easier proposition? You know, what are the additional, what's the marginal benefit of going that much faster? And, and one should be sort of careful about that if one's, you know, one's expecting a lot of, you know, spectrum to get reallocated and so on. Um, I've only heard once about something which is, which is a huge issue on this in wireline, wireless versus wireline policy now and other things. The only time I ever heard anything mentioned about a data cap was as a way to monetize uh, these, uh, you know, to recover the cost of these investments. Um, data cap is, there, is the killer here. You know, it's, it's not so much speed. As I think somebody else said earlier on, you know, you know, wireless is fine for email, but if you try to watch a Netflix movie an hour into it, you're, you're done. Uh, and, you know, so with all the talk about what's going on here, I think latency is really important, but also, is there, if you're really going to get people to cut the cord, in a literal sense, not in the mistaken sense in which it usually gets used, um, would, uh, you know, is that part of the story? Is there something that's going to get around that? Is there something about the way networks are managed now that won't have to happen in a 5G world, so you won't have, people won't be nearly as bound by this? Um, one thing that I think could help, I'll move things sort of more in favor here a little bit, is, um, is you know, how is this going to track out with the universal service obligations? Again, something one gets a little sensitive to with the FCC. Um, uh, the FCC right now has been talking about 25 megabits as sort of the standard. Um, as far as I know, the basis for that is so, is so mom, dad, Johnny, and Jimmy can all watch HDTV streams at the same time. I'm not exactly sure that ought to be the criterion for you know public in, you know public investment to support this sort of thing, but you know should it be is there going to be something that says well it'll be a hundred megahertz a gigabit whatever something else to think about. Um, uh, coming up just on on a few things here at the end. One is a phrase I've heard here one needs to be careful about because engineers and policy people will hear it different ways, which are references to the network. Once upon a time, I'm old enough to remember that once we had the phone company, and having the phone company got a lot of people agitated, including things like bringing antitrust cases against them, regulating all sorts of things they could do and stuff like that. You know, if you say the network, some people may hear, okay, if there's the network, we're going to regulate the prices of accessing the network and perhaps letting independent retailers provide the actual customer contact with it. I don't think that's what people have in mind or want. There's a lot of obviously competitive experts here, but when you say the phrase the network and using things like host independent cells and stuff like that, one kind of has to wonder, they're kind of a sharing thing that comes naturally to engineers perhaps may not seem quite so benign to, uh, in, in the policy world. Um, we've heard the content, we've got two more points, we've heard the, the content delivery integration. You know, I'm old, so we're getting there. And as long as I've been in this business, I've been hearing about content delivery integration. I mean, you know, computer to anyone. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, we broke up the phone, well, the Justice Department broke up the phone company. I was there then, you know. So, well, I guess the content delivery integration thing didn't seem quite such a big deal then, but well, maybe now it is. And, and what's important about that is that, uh, is that obviously the FCC public policy is, is notoriously going in the other direction. Um, which is to say there's content providers, there's broadband internet access providers, and we're going to explicitly deal with the rules for that. And that gets to the last point, which is, which actually reiterates something that um, Commissioner Olhausen said, and it's been alluded to a little bit by others, which is I think the most important thing that policymakers can do is to allow rather than discourage experimentation. When I first started thinking about net neutrality issues like that, the thing that sort of bugged me about the policy, this is before the 2015 or this is going back to like 2010 or so, is the thing about this that seems most peculiar is, is, your, is precluding experimentation by forcing everybody to be treated the same. In the open and internet order, there are at least allusions to the idea that the early AT&T Apple deal, exclusive deal on the iPhone, was a bad thing that might have violated this policy. I think that's one of the great success stories of, uh, of technological development in this area. You know, after people proved that it worked, then it spread around, but, you know, it, but that was probably not all that obvious at the time. And so, well, how do you do it? Well, as we've got to 
big joint investment thing here. Let's, you know, exclusive dealing is a well-known way of addressing that sort of thing. And so, um, so trying to main, keep public policy open to saying, let's try this, let's try this, instead of rules saying that you can't try this and can't try that might be something to keep in mind. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was uh, great. Thank you. Jonathan, you, you got to... And I couldn't agree more with you. Thank you, you so much, you got to follow that. So, uh, but also, let me start by thanking Georgetown and, and you, Larry, and, and John, and Carolyn as well for bringing <coughs> us together, and of course, our colleague, Peter Asavi from the WTA, thank you very much for allowing us to have this conversation and for allowing me to participate in it. Um, I was actually in thinking about how do we create um, either uh, precedents for moving forward in appropriate ways and providing the scaffolding and frameworking on a policy level for uh, advancing our ambitions for 5G. I, I really wanted to go back and look at, well, how did we do it? through the earlier generations or the iterations through generations. And I actually realized that it was 15 years ago yesterday that President Clinton issued his executive memorandum and my friend Jim Kohlenberger and I were working together at the time uh, mandating that NTIA and FCC get to work on band planning for 3G. And think how far in only 15 years we've come and cascading upwards through these generations of networks uh, now poised as we are uh, for realizing the potential of 5G. Um, I guess in for mandates that we raise as we have today, uh, the fundamental question is what is 5G? And I think Tom Wheeler actually had a very good and apt description where he likened it to a Pablo Picasso painting where we're all looking at the concept of 5G and we're really seeing various different things. I would suggest that in absent yet of standardizations and band plans universally harmonized, it's even more abstract than a Pablo Picasso. I would actually think that the better uh, art criticism we could do is on Jackson Pollock. Um, <laughs> the good news is, and I think even with our work today, that the toolkit of 5G is coming into slightly better focus. Uh, we know, unlike the earlier generations of networks, that, that have been step changes in increasing power in the, our palms, that 5G, both conceptually and paradigmatically, is something significantly more. Um, conceptually, we know that even though the rubrics that we've come to understand of smarter, faster, lower latency are certainly technically correct, there is uh, other dimensions that will uh, help us define what 5G will bring. Increasingly dense, massively ubiquitous, virtualized, and compellingly software-defined, I think that this next generation may indeed, with all apologies to Tom Brokaw, truly be the great generation. Um, especially, and, and I would disagree with you slightly, Tim, if we imagine a world where there will be, despite our efforts on a regulatory level to interconnect 50 billion devices simultaneously, which will be an attribute of 5G's ubiquity, uh, the implications here are unimaginably transformative. We've spoken of use cases. I want to delve a little bit further than I think the very compelling use cases that have been offered, for example, by Commissioner Olhausen, who reminded us that it might, that the killer app or potentially more appropriately, the life-enhancing or life-affirming app of uh, connected health, particularly massively and continuously connected health monitoring, uh, will, is one instance of a use case that will have profound implications. We've heard of smart cars, smart homes, increasingly, uh, increasingly smart industrial Internet of Things applications, but I, I would invite us to really think a little bit more expansively about what the true use cases are likely to be, most of which, again, themselves will be unimaginable. But in this increasingly dense and ubiquitously connected 5G world, where we're actually going to begin to see, uh, see as early as you know, the, the event uh, venues at the Olympics in Korea and Japan by the end of the decade, uh, are things that actually go a little bit beyond what we 
have normally conceived in a 4G environment as consumer use cases. We're going to be seeing mainstream adoption of both, of both virtual and augmented reality, contextually aware environments of the sorts that have been promulgated very substantially by Qualcomm and its gimbal work becoming facts of everyday life. We're going to be seeing um, incredible new steps in advanced robotics, advanced precision manufacturing, ultra high definition, um, unmanned or unwomaned aerial vehicles, both academic and commercial, which will be in, you know, utilizing and leveraging all of the tactile real-time control that 5G will give them, uh, really becoming integrated into um, our, our social, economic, cultural, and academic lives, um, given the lower latencies that 5G will allow. Importantly, I think as well, as our colleague Reed Hunt, I think, usefully uh, pointed to in a recent uh, PowerPoint that a colleague had sent around, that it's not just going to be use cases that will be impacted by the, our, our advancement through iteration, the next iteration to 5G. It also will be how we will see incredibly new value chains created within the internet ecosystem to which we've become dependent, uh, globally dependent. Ecosystems that will go far more uh, beyond uh, the kinds of value chains that we now are experiencing of core to edge, um, cloud to consumer, but also implicating huge value chain shifts in um, storage, networking, computing, and uh, the business models that they implicate. Key question, and I, I think we're going to be delving deeper on this today, is, well, how do we get there? What is to be done, um, to use a, a line from Lennon? Um, and I would shamelessly uh, cut and paste a, a, a view, a vision that my colleague Jim Kohlenberger had referenced in his earlier uh, paper that he had mentioned that he wrote uh, with my organization, Mobile Future, where he, he pointed to four significant policy pipelines, or pipelines that actually we need to give more focused attention to. One, of course, is the Spectrum Pipeline. Jim importantly mentioned that U.S. networks actually carry the third lowest amount of spectrum available for long-term evolution globally. In fact, Germany has 26 times more spectrum dedicated per subscriber than we do here in the U.S. We need more giddy up than woe, particularly as we understand that it takes 6 to 13 years to free up spectrum, uh, given the various technical and regulatory processes to which we have been accustomed to or inured, depending on your perspective. Second pipeline is the innovation pipeline. We know that $260 billion in CapEx and OpEx have been devoted by network operators in the broader ecosystem to advancing uh, what we've come to uh, appreciate here, which is very, very advanced networks in our country. More still needs to be spent even to get us through the very promising next steps within 4G. We must keep our eyes on that prize. But we also need to think about what we can do to accelerate the innovation pipeline measured in incentives for in increasing investment, both on the um, capital markets and on the debt, debt markets side. The third pipeline is the R&D pipeline. Sadly, as Jim reminds us, uh, where in 1968, uh, federal dollars spent on basic research in R&D were about 10% of our gross budget. Uh, this year, it's down to 3%. This will be another three weeks of conferences, but I hope we can think through what we can do to encourage greater, more multi-stakeholder thinking about public-private partnerships, working with our agencies in the United States government, catalyzing further ways of, of really putting more gas into our um, R&D tank federally. And the last, and this again is a macro, I think, catalyst or input to how we can perceive our advancement to 5G and indeed to future generations, is we really need to give both artful and real-time thinking and not lose our focus on uh, 
really keeping the STEM pipeline um, productive and meaningful. It is not a small point, and Larry and I live in the Bay Area, and I've been working in technology and building technology businesses, that there today are half a million unfilled jobs, good jobs, coders, product developers, engineers in our country. If we are to maintain and advance our leadership globally in realizing the promise of 5G and a range of other innovative and disruptive technologies, our, our commitment to STEM must uh, proceed well beyond the profound commitment that this White House and this administration has given to it to whatever succeeding generation of not only network but also political administration will follow us. I hope we can ad advance some thinking on each of these subjects. Thank you very much. Um, so, Dipayan, tell us about this. Wh where, where is the administration? Where is the White House on the 5G world? Tell us uh, what we're longing to hear. <laughs> sure. Um, so, uh, just, just for context, the administration has done uh, quite a few things in the area of spectrum policy over the past several years before I came into uh, the administration and since I have joined. Um, as soon as he took office, President Obama um, started asking questions about our spectrum policy issues. And, um, you know, I, I see there being two branches to spectrum policy, one where we try to pursue structural policy changes to the way that the government and potential industry licensees can, um, can employ or give up spectrum uh, and create more flexibilities um, in that whole system. And then second, um, very specifically, what we, can, what we can do to free up certain bands that are of interest to eventually consumers. Um, and so, uh, you know, on that point, to that end, the president uh, released uh, a presidential memorandum, which is essentially uh, an executive uh, action in 2010, uh, where he said to the administration that he wanted to clear up 500 megahertz of, of uh, spectrum, um, which is very impactful. NTIA is, has, has taken significant steps to, uh, on the path to getting there uh, over the next, um, that was a 2010 memorandum, uh, and, it, and it projected over the next 10 years to release 500 megahertz, and NTIA is uh, very diligently getting there. Um, and, um, you know, we, we really are trying to keep that timeline, uh, but also, you know, given considerations in 2010 are not um, what they are now in terms of what we might need to, uh, to get consumers what they want in 2020, um, we're also taking stock of all of that and uh, uh, developing new uh, spectrum policy initiatives. Um, and then in 2013, um, partly in response to the 2012 uh, memorandum, or rather report by his, uh, his uh, PCAST council, the president released uh, another memorandum, uh, executive action, uh, where he essentially asked the administration to take steps to uh, pursue more innovative strategies around spectrum policy and, um, and the pipeline, uh, and designated a spectrum policy team um, coordinated by the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, the National Economic Council, uh, and others in the administration, including the Office of Management and Budget, uh, to really aggressively pursue uh, ways to clear up more spectrum and, and, and consider how we can build in these flexibilities into the policy system. Um, so that's, that's the context. And um, uh, I guess right after the release of that memo, we started hearing things about 5G. Um, so what is 5G? I mean, it's been answered many times by many people today. Um, but essentially, you know, the, the two key characteristics I take away are uh, higher bandwidth and lower latency, uh, which will lead to many of the uh, types of uh, innovations and technologies that John uh, so eloquently um, uh, outlined. Uh, that said, you know, in terms of standards, we're, we're not even close to that uh, finalization yet, and it is very much like, I, I also think that it's more like a uh, Pollock painting than uh, Picasso uh, at this time. Um, so what we, know, what we know is that 5G can lead to all these technological innovations in the long term. 
Um, we don't know what the standards are. We don't know what the um, international community is doing to the point. Um, and meanwhile, we have a lot of leaders in industry who are stepping up to uh, make pretty significant investments in this space. We also have the academic community um, doing really great things. Um, this is my personal view, but uh, really I, I don't think that um, the U I, I think the U.S. government needs to take its cues from the public in terms of what to do. Um, we're not uh, a government that traditionally engages in really strong industrial policy, and we've seen some of the dangers in doing so, um, both here and internationally. Um, and I, I don't think uh, we would get into the game of, um, you know, really leaning in hard on um, recommending or suggesting investments in certain spaces. That's, that's not the type of game this, this government has played in the past, and we're the leaders in, in um, uh, wireless innovation internationally. Um, I think we really need to sit it out um, while, uh, you know, at the same time investigating further all of the points that John and um, uh, Jim in his paper uh, pointed out. Um, and uh, I think that we're starting to do that. So in the past year, we've launched uh, new initiatives, including um, initiatives on community broadband, on municipal broadband, um, and we have convened uh, or set out the, uh, the Broadband Opportunity Council, which is a cabinet level uh, council uh, across the administration, which um, in, in which the president has asked his cabinet to take stock of all of their federal programs around broadband and um, take steps to, um, to essentially make broadband more available to uh, the end American consumer. Um, and we, we announced several steps on that in the, in the past few months. We, we hope to do more in the coming months, uh, and that includes uh, new steps on spectrum policy. Um, so we're, you know, again, we're at a stage of listening. Um, we we want to work with the public. We want to uh, uh, he hear the public out and um, uh, take actions in the in in in, in the public's interest. So, um, you know, we're we're kind of in that phase where we don't know what the standards are going to be, and um, yet we want to, as some of you have said, um, just keep the doors open to. Uh, any policy and regulatory changes that might be needed to encourage more innovation while not shutting, uh, shutting down doors. Um, and uh, I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you. I, I just want to clarify, when you talk about the 2010 memorandum and the 500 megahertz, that was 500 megahertz of spectrum currently under the control of the federal government right. that we're trying to now redeploy for... Yeah, principally the, well. uh, under control by the federal government, but also uh, it, 600 it megahertz. No, no, but that's different. So there was uh, the national broadband plan said. Yeah. Now I don't remember the numbers. 300 megahertz of spectrum by 2015. By, by 2015 and 500 okay. by 2020. 20. Right, Blair. Why, why is everybody looking at Blair? I don't know. <laughs> why, why would we look at Blair? But, but I just need him to do another plan. <laughs> Come on. But the plan also <laughs> called for redeployment of underused or underutilized or unused federal spectrum, and that's what the 2010 right. memorandum. That's that's what NTIA works on. The FCC works on, on the other side. So that that's great. Thank you. So uh, Anna Maria, let me come to you. Uh, last but not least, given, uh, as we all recognize that that the policy of the United States or the way that we do this kind of deployments is, uh, as Depine said, uh, much more, uh, it's not centralized or it's not an industrial policy. And what we heard earlier today on the previous panel about the investment climate uh, on Wall Street, uh, what, what can we expect uh, in, in terms of developing 5G technology? What, what are some of the obstacles that might be there uh, from the private investment standpoint that we can free up either from a policy standpoint or, or from better definition of the use case. So presumably, Wall Street investors don't like Jackson Pollock or Pablo Picasso. Um, <laughs> they, they probably want to see more uh, some naturalistic paint. I see now you've lost my... Huh? Um, 
We'll let you think about the artwork. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> and in the meantime, thank you for having me on the panel to you and, and John and, and Carolyn uh, and Georgetown. Let me begin by saying that I, I spent about 30 years as a financial analyst and uh, started that in 1982. And one of the first things I did covering telecom was to go to uh, Rochester Telephone where they showed me a step-by-step -step switch which was probably the size of this building and provided, uh, I don't know, a couple of thousand lines maybe. And it took up almost the whole building and the almost part was an electronic switch on the ground floor which had a lot more lines and was the size of a small closet. And that was the first time I understood uh, what chip technology really was about. But it also has given me all of those years since then, watching one technology after another evolve, has given me comfort with being where we are today on 5G. It's always a Jackson Pollock picture, uh, 10 years before it's deployed. And in some ways, I think we are better off than uh, we have been in the past because we already have a pretty clear idea of what uh, 4.5G, which is LTE advanced, which is just about ready to be deployed, um, looks like. So I'm not terribly concerned at the fact that all we have in some ways right now are some goalposts. We know what we want for speed, we know what we want for bandwidth, and I'm very comfortable we'll get there because we've s I've seen us get there over and over again over the last 30 odd years. What it takes, obviously, and I, I'm sure you all realize the two takeaways from today are we need more spectrum and we need investment. Um, collectively, from 1985, when the wireless networks first began to be deployed up to the end of last year that took $430 billion. And we are looking at something like $30 billion more each year. And we're looking at it in an environment in which the investment community is in fact getting quite nervous and uncomfortable about uh, the combination of the need for a lot of capital both for infrastructure and for what has become suddenly very expensive spectrum. Um, AWS3 auction, I think, was a shock to everyone's system. And, um, and obviously, a lot of capital for build out. And as Jennifer pointed out earlier, there is a lot of pressure because we are now at the point where everyone from H2 on up in this country seems to be walking around with at least one wireless device. Maybe it's six months and up. Some of the youngsters are pretty good with their iPads. So I think one of the takeaways is, yes, we need a lot of investment, and we can't just take it for granted that it's going to materialize. What has always funded the next generation was the current generation. So in order to get to 5G, everyone in the ecosystem today, and that is the carriers, the manufacturers of the infrastructure, the manufacturers of, of the devices, all of them have to be profitable enough to be able to reinvest in R&D, in retooling, in the case of the equipment manufacturers, and in, in infrastructure build out in the case of, um, of the carriers. So there is a trade-off between capital investment and spectrum. The more spectrum you have, the easier it is to deploy. You still have to put out a lot of CapEx, but you're not wasting it for lack of spectrum, which is why, again, the point that has been made over and over again today is we've got to get more spectrum out. And the good news is that not, you know, the FCC is focused on that, the NTIA is focused on that, um, it is very nice to see that Congress is now also becoming once again focused on it. It was one of the, the things that got done on a bipartisan basis in 2012 in what was a fairly tough environment then, and hopefully it'll 
get done again in, in 2015 um, or 2016 in, in the current environment. Um, so to me, the essentially, the bottom line <coughs> is we are focused, we need to continue to be focused on, on both, making sure that every part of the uh, internet ecosystem can be profitable and we need to make sure that the spectrum is available. And obviously, just in terms of the timeline, the first piece is the 600 megahertz auction coming up at the moment scheduled for March. And it is critical that as much spectrum as possible, um, you know, be bought back from the broadcasters. There's not likely to be a second chance to do that. And, and that everyone who possibly can then participates in that auction um, on the, on the uh, wireless side. Thanks. Okay, well thank you. Let me, I'm gonna have a, I have a couple follow-up questions. I'll direct it initially to one person, but anyone on the panel can take, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the audience. Um, and it tees off of what you just said, Anna Maria. There's, you say what we need is more spectrum and more investment. So what we've heard today, uh, what I took away is, um, one of the things I took away is that obviously at, the, at these higher frequencies, um, there's less of a problem, but anything below a gigahertz, we're talking not about new spectrum, we're talking about reallocation of existing spectrum that's held by a variety of licensees for a variety of particular, usually very specified uses. Um, so Tim, from, from your experience, uh, particularly at the FCC, what did you learn that might suggest uh, there are better ways to reallocate spectrum than, than the systems we've got in place so far? Um, I wish I, I really, honest to God, wish I had a great answer to that question. Um, one of the, when I got to the FCC, there were a number of issues that the chief economist could kind of choose to get involved with, and I didn't get involved much in the incentive auction issue, mostly because there's already so much expertise, so much genuine expertise already at hand that I could, you know, study that all year and be still be five years behind everybody else who has been, been thinking about it. But, um, it, you know, but from, from what I saw, there are you know, very smart people working on it, that it was very difficult, a real political hot potato, in and out of the courts all the time, been delayed at least twice, I guess. Uh, and, um, and it does certainly make you think whether you know, there's some way to do it. I mean, it's just peculiar. It's like, you know, we have to you know, we're reallocating spectrum that these people don't even own. Uh, and it's, you know, so um, one of the things that just made me think about was, a, or maybe sort of wonder, was whether there would be a better way to do it. And everybody here all day has been talking about the, the need to do this. I mean, as an economist, I frame this as the idea that there's spectrum being done that's, that, that's worth this much in some sense of the economy, and there's spectrum that could be worth this much to the economy. And how do we get, you know, from, you know, reallocate this so it could be used for that purpose, uh, and it, and it's 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 really hard. And and uh, I I wish I saw something and made me think it would be easier, but I I wasn't on the impression that there was some really great answers sitting around there that people were holding back on. I I do know that there were some criticisms, and I don't know them in detail, unfortunately. I think I think Commissioner Pye has criticized the incentive auction process for being more complicated than it had to be, but between the, the legal and political clout of the broadcasters and everything that went into the legislation, including, you know, the money has to be used for this purpose and that purpose and that sort of thing, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I don't think that, that the people who were, the staff people who were working on the design, the incentive auction, said, yeah, let's, let's make it complicated for the heck of it. I mean, I think that they, they felt that they had to for a whole lot of very difficult transactional reasons. A anybody else have any thoughts about it? Well, not so much on the incentive auction as a lot of other spectrum does, in fact, need to be reallocated. And the point of, because there are federal incumbents, for example, is, as I think you pointed out, um, and one of the things that Congress is looking at is creating incentives. Mm -hmm for agencies um, to give up spectrum. At the moment, all that can be done is reimburse them for the cost of moving, and it would take legislation to allow the agencies to actually get some of the benefit mm -hmm. out of auctioning the spectrum. So um, 
I think that would be terrific to have the to give them the opportunity uh, to move in a way that feels more voluntary than perhaps it has in the past. Yeah. I was supposed to say something very quick. When I was at the CEA in 1996, in the economic report of the president, it was for my job to draft the chapter on telecommunications policy, and this was when some of the big spectrum auctions were happening. And even without explicitly mentioning the idea that maybe, well, maybe, maybe the agencies would economize on spectrum if they had to pay for it, I was getting angry phone calls from the Department of Justice saying, are you saying we would have to pay for, you know, the police would have to pay for spectrum or that sort of stuff? So it's, it's a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult even within the government. I mean, I, I applaud the, the, the uh, you know, the, the movements that this current administration has done that have been described, but it's not like you can, well, you can, you can lead the horse to water, but. And, and even though the, um, the silver bullets for incentives have not yet been either delivered or articulated yet. There has been some important work that's been going on, not only congressionally, but the executive branch about really thinking about how do we actually move the needle on creating viable and sustainable incentives. There's conversations now that uh, have been actually uh, formed at OMB, advancing. They're, they're baby steps, but they're important. Things such as can we statutorily change how we use the Spectrum Reserve Fund, which was created in the Spectrum Act of 2012 to um, allow for uh, a, a wider range of uses of those funds towards sharing uh, and other innovative ways of creating incentives around Spectrum. Um, we do not yet have a Nobel Prize in regulatory science. Uh, potentially we should if indeed still 60 to 70 percent according to our colleagues at the CTIA suggest that uh, or that, that federal uh, license holders literally hold 60 to 70 percent of all uh, wireless spectrum that might be applied for, for consumer uses. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, the clock is ticking. Um, and I think that there, there really is a, uh, a need for speed, um, not only in developing and implementing specific incentives, um, thinking anew and, and in creative ways about CBO scoring and other types of initiatives mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. um, but embedding uh, uh, in, in not just in the executive branch but congressionally some significant action, hopefully even uh, this year uh, into next year, on advancing concrete ideas around incentives that would uh, allow our federal holders to move more briskly. Yeah. D Divine, did you want to jump in? Um, do you know the silver bullet? You have <laughs> <it>? <laughs> um, I mean, I don't want to uh, speak before uh, you know certain things might, uh, as things could move in the um, uh, coming year on uh, the legislative front, and, and you know OMB and we through OMB are having some some conversations about uh, things that could be could be done around spectrum innovation, um, but I mean. In, in my personal view, it makes complete sense for, uh, and, and I think you, you mentioned this, Anna Maria, to, to enable an agency to say they're, you know, they're covering a band right now, um, to give up half that band to the FCC and um, have the FCC license it out uh, on the condition that the agency gets reimbursed by the industrial consortium or whomever eventually licenses that half of the band. And you know, also sponsors some of the technology that helps the agency be doubly efficient in the half of the band that it, mm -hmm. you know, retains. Um, and that process is not allowed right now. Um, it's um, for various, various, uh, various reasons. Um, but that, that's the type of mechanism that we want to enable um, because it's a win-win for every, uh, it, it, it's, it's good for consumers, it's good for um, innovation, and it's, um, it, brings us forward in, in terms of technology, um, and it helps the agency uh, retain um, the utility that it, that it needs out of, uh, out of the spectrum that it holds. So I think that that's, that's, that would be the dream if, yeah. if we could make that happen. Well, that's a really good point, actually, because one of the things that we saw in the last kind of inventory is a lot of the, 
a lot of the federal spectrum that is being used is not being used very efficiently. So if you look at DOD and Department of Justice, a lot of their CCT systems, CCTV systems, so on, are old technology which are bandwidth hogs. And if they could be given a way of moving to a better technology, they wouldn't need the same spectrum. They wouldn't need as much. I have, I have another follow-up question, but I, I don't want to monopolize this. So let me uh, see what we've got uh, from, from the audience. And if we don't, I will ask my second question, which is following up on Anna Maria's point about the need for more investment. So, uh, and let me start with you first, Jonathan. So we heard in Commissioner Olhausen's talk about sort of the multiple agencies that now theoretically, or in fact in practice, have jurisdiction over a lot of the use cases uh, for 5G technology. Uh, I did a, a piece last week in the Washington Post where I actually ranked the seven technologies most, seven innovators most at risk of, of being overregulated a, as a result of mm -hmm. that multiple, and what I didn't realize when I wrote it was those are all 5G applications. That now I, I now know <laughs> everything's a 5G. So all the things like 3D printing and robotics and everything's a 5G application. What do you see as the, as the risk to our, to our long-standing system of permissionless innovation, um, and, and how, how real is it that the FDA and the FAA and, and all the other agencies who previously had little or nothing to do with the digital revolution, now because of these use cases, theoretically or actually do have jurisdiction and don't have the experience to know when to apply it and when not to apply it. Um, you know, it was Adam Thier who, who, in trying to define permissionless innovation, said it was essentially this, innovate first and regulate second. You know, curiously, and this is a bit of a side story, but um, he, he also suggested that the reason that European economies, OECD economies, haven't been as successful in ramping up on their innovation pipeline is because they reversed that order. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually working in the internet um, companies in Europe in the 2000s as 3G was actually being ramped up when the European, at both at the transnational level, the EC, and the state levels, did in fact begin this process of regulating first, innovating second. But the industrial policies that they actually implemented, which was let's do top-down band planning, let's, let's actually structure in a very, very rigorous way our approaches to designing, deploying uh, auctions, um, allowed, curiously, uh, for a brief amount of time, the Europeans to move very, very rapidly and even exceed our own development path in deploying 3G. Um, now we're seeing, in a sense, that same calculus at work, where not only in the key European economies at the EC level, but also the Koreans, the Japanese, the Russians, Russians working with the Chinese, the Chinese working with the, the EC, uh, are themselves beginning to take or hew towards more of these industrial policy approaches of regulating first, innovating second, hoping maybe to emulate what they were able to achieve in 3G. That should not be a model for what we do here in the United States. We have been gloriously successful in creating the architecture and the framework for permissionless innovation that allows us to ramp up quickly, fail even faster, and iterate beyond that. Um, we need to encourage continued application of that basic principle by our agencies of government, even as they begin to stare down this massively big thing that is still abstract. It's called 5G. Um, and uh, it is, in, in a sense, on us in, in many respects. We in the technology policy community, we in the innovative companies, to continue to, in partnership with our regulatory agencies, our executive branch and Congress, make sure that all of the, um, the economic productivity gains, the social and publicly beneficial impacts that we've seen that have been wrought by our ecosystem of permissionless innovation both apply to licensed and unlicensed uh, bans, um, have been considerable, are measured, and uh, are real. So it's a, it's a joint and shared obligation to move forward on our continued path of permissionless innovation. It's one that's defined our political sociology and technology innovation policy for the last 20 years, and I hope it will continue to do so for the next 20 years. Mm. It, uh, we're running out of time, but does anybody want a last word? We'll give it to Jonathan. How about thank you, Larry? All right, thank you all. Thank you very much. I can see that not me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the question you want me to ask.